We're going to run through an example of sizing simple span wide flange steel beams using multi-frame. The structural example will be a two-story building with a column spacing of 42 feet by 42 feet and a secondary uh, beam spacing of 7 feet. There are two primary uh, goals of this exercise. One is for you to verify that the tables for sizing steel beams and multi-frame produce the same wide flange beam sizes for simple span uniformly loaded beams. The only exception to this rule is that when sizing for strength, multi-frame multi is slightly more conservative than the tables, where the tables show that a certain cross-section is just barely satisfactory for strength, multi-frame might call for the next size up from that. Where stiffness governs the size of the cross-section, tables and multi-frame all, multi always get exactly the same answer. <clears throat> The second goal is to familiarize yourself with multi-frame as an analytic tool. Multi-frame is not as fast as tables for sizing simple span horizontal beams under uniform load, but multi-frame can do amazing and spectacular structures that cannot be analyzed from tables. Multi-frame opens up a world of design possibilities, some of which we will have a chance to explore in this course as we go along. This is the basic framing plan. Each of these circles represents a column. The columns may not necessarily be circular, but in this simple diagrammatic form, that's the way we express them. We have a series of primary members. These are primary perimeter members here and here. Here we have interior primary members. And then all of these members are secondary members spanning between the primary members. Again, I'll remind you that primary members for many years were called girders and still are, and occasionally I will lapse into that terminology, and secondary beams are called joist. Um, but the most accepted verbiage at this point is uh, primary members versus secondary members, and that will be the verbiage that you see in multi-frame when we go into that program. In order to size all the typical members in this system, we only need to construct this much of the structure in multi-frame because it contains a perimeter primary member, interior primary member, and secondary members, which are the members that we need to size. This is a spreadsheet showing the beam sizing processes based on tables, which we have already done. The beam loads for the secondary beams are highlighted, so that's here and there, and I'll blow this image up in a minute. But I'm isolating them off to make the point that the only loads we put on the structure in multi-frame are on the secondary members, because multi-frame already accounts for the transfer of loads from secondary members to primary members. The loads on the primary members are shown here, and there, and there, and there, and we calculated those previously because uh, the tables do not automatically account for the transfer of load, so it became our responsibility to calculate all the loads that would occur on the primary members. So first we're going to size everything for stiffness, but before we jump into that, I'm going to blow this up so you can see these highlighted cells. These are the loads on the roof joist, and here we have the loads on the floor joist. Those are the only loads that we're going to be adding into multi-frame. Okay, so zooming in even further on this diagram or this spreadsheet, Highlighted in blue are all the member sizes that, or cross-sectional sizes that we calculated based on tables for the condition of stiffness or the, uh, the uh, criterion of stiffness. In pink, we have all the sections we derived based on the criterion of strength. And then in yellow, we take the larger of those where they do not agree. In other words, stiffness prevails or strength prevails as the determining factor, we always have to satisfy both. So in yellow, we've highlighted those sections 
that work for both stiffness and strength. So <clears throat> as per the instructions of this assignment, we're first going to develop a multi-frame file that accounts for stiffness as the criterion. Then we're going to save that off and develop another file which accounts for strength. And then we'll save that off and develop another multi-frame file that accounts for both stiffness and strength. Before we start that process, though, there's one other thing that we need to calculate. Our stiffness criterion is that the maximum deflection allowed under live load is the length of the member divided by 360. In this case, the member is 42 feet long, and when we convert that to inches by multiplying by 12 inches per foot, and then we divide by 360, we get a maximum allowed deflection under live load of 1.4 inches. This is a little bit different from the way we did it in tables because we never actually calculated this number, but we always applied this criterion in our mathematics to arrive at whatever the ultimate uh, required cross-section was. So we're going to go open a multi-frame file, and I have one here. And we're going to go about creating this frame in the most efficient way that we know how to do it. There are a lot of different ways to construct something in multi-frame. And what I'm going to show you is what I think is the fastest method for this particular structure. But as I say, we'll learn lots of different techniques for creating and manipulating structures as we go along. So the technique we're going to use is we're going to go up to this icon, which is create the portal frame, and we highlight that. Now we said we need bas basically two of these 42 by 42 foot bays. So in, in the terminology though of multi-frame, the number of bays has to do with the number of bays in the frame. So we're going to put two bays in the frame. We've already agreed this is a two-story building. One is uh, one floor is slab on grade, the other floor is elevated, and then we have a roof that we have to account for. But there is a total of two stories. And then to create depth in the other direction, we need two frames. And we're going to make the base spacing 42 feet. And we're going to make the story height 15 feet. And we could make this anything. We can make it 12, 14, 16, whatever. It's not particularly crucial to what we're doing because right now we're just sizing the beams for gravity loads. And then finally, the spacing of the frames is 42. And then we have the number of secondary beams. So I'm going to jump back here and define what the number of secondary beams means in multi-frame. It means the number of these interior beams that are subdividing into these spaces. So there's one, two, three, four, five. That defines what multi-frame means by that. So we're going to put in five secondary beams, like so. And we click OK, and now we've got the frame. Now, one of the things that happens in multi-frame is if I rotate this thing around, my, my structure rotates off the screen. So I'm going to select the entire thing, which, by the way, I can do by doing Control-All, or I can highlight that in the following way. And now I'm going to go move that. So I go to geometry, and unfortunately move is off the screen here, but you can find it down under this menu called geometry. And I go to that, and I'm going to move it minus 42 feet in the x direction, and minus 21 feet in the z direction, and I end up with this. And then I hit control total, which says, it shows me the total structure within the window that we're looking at. And I'm going to rotate this around a little bit to make it easier to see and easier to manipulate. And now we have the geometry of this frame depicted in multi-frame. Now I want to select all the bottom joints because I know that multi-frame is going to assist that I support this structure against the vertical force. 
It's also going to force me to restrain the structure against movement in the X and Z directions because it will think that I don't understand that the building needs that even though I'm not going to put any forces on it that are going to cause any reactions in that direction, multi-frame simply won't perform the analysis because it's assuming that I've overlooked something. Now I want to control these points and I could just put something that's a pin joint which keeps it from moving in X, Y, or Z direction. But I'd like to constrain this building also so it wouldn't tend to fall over. And again, multi-frame, if, if you show it, uh, a geometry or a structure that does not appear to be restrained against falling over, it will not do the analysis. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to put a fixed joint which supports movement against X, Y, and Z, but also rotation in any direction about the support points. Now those points in the building may ultimately not be moment joints. For example, we might come in and put in some kind of braced frames or triangulation that will stabilize this building. But for right now, we're not designing for wind load. We're not at that level of detail that we're designing any of that. We're just looking at the sizing of the horizontal members relative to gravity forces. So as long as I put in a fixed joint there that will not allow the columns to tilt over, multi-frame will be happy and will allow me to proceed with my analysis. Now I'm going to go up here and I'm going to select member slope and I'm going to pick vertical which <clears throat> highlights my columns and then I'm going to go give the columns a section from the section library. And what we stated in our example problems was that we would initially like to make this column absurdly stiff in other words, we want it to shorten the minimal amount under any gravity loads so that whatever deflections in the vertical direction that we see are deformations in the horizontal beams and not shortening of the vertical columns. So we're going to go down here to pick out the heaviest section that anybody makes, which by the way is typically used for columns. It's called a W14 by 808, which means the 14 means it's part of a series that, uh, if you roll it enough times, ends up in a 14-inch deep uh, section. The 808 means it weighs 808 pounds per foot. This is a diagram of the cross-section, which gives you a sense of how fat the flanges in the web are. So it's a very, very sturdy column, and I'm going to put that in. That will certainly not be the column that we would end up with in a very lightweight two-story structure like this, but just to get us started and get us over the first stage of sizing the horizontal beams, this will do great. Typically, we have to size the horizontal beams before we size the columns because we don't know how to size the columns if we don't know all the loads that they are supporting, and part of the loads they're supporting are the gravity loads or the self-weight of these beams. So we now have columns in our building that allow us to get past the next step. And now we have to decide how are we going to size the beams. And what we're going to do initially is we've said we're going to address the issue of stiffness of the beams. And so we would normally just put a section in there. We'd then analyze it. Then we'd find it doesn't work. We'd go pick another one and we just go back and forth in a trial and error process which is tedious and annoying. And in our case, we don't have to do that because we have already done the sizing procedures that allow us to have an initial value for all this. This came out of sizing these beams from tables. And the roof, app, roof uh, joist or secondary beams, we size to be a W16 by 26. That's 16 inches deep and 26 pounds per foot. So when I go back to multi-frame, I'm going to highlight all those beams. And then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to give them a W16 by 26. And look at that. It, just by accident, it couldn't be more convenient. It's immediately in the field of view, and I set that. Now I'm going to highlight these perimeter primary beams and I'm going to go back 
to my diagram and it says they're supposed to be W21 by 44 in sizing for stiffness. So I go back to multi-plane. I pick the sections library. I go up to 21 by 44. And now I'm going to go do this one. And in order to do that one, it's a 24 by 62. Now I'm going to go to the floor, pick the secondary beams or joist. I go back here and they're supposed to be a 21 by 50. We highlight those and select that section. Now we're going to do the perimeter girders or perimeter primary members. We come here, they're supposed to be a 30 by 90. And then finally, we're going to size these which are W33 by 118. And now we have a complete structure, which uh, with all the sections specified, we can render it if we want to render it, sort of get a sense of the proportions of things. But we're, we now have a structure and we can analyze that structure. The only limitation is we don't have any loads on it yet. So now we have to put some loads in. We can, we're currently in this frame window. We can go to the loads window, which we can do here. Or if you have trouble seeing these icons or you're not an icon person, you can go to this windows menu and pick load. And now I'm going to say control T to get that totally within the field of view. And I'm going to rotate it around to make it easy to select members. And then I'll zoom in a little bit just in case that's useful to me. So now I need to put some loads on it though. And before I can put some loads, I have to create load cases. So here I have a menu that allows me to load things, but first I need some cases. So I'm going to go add a case, self weight, and I click OK. And by the way, the data you see on here tells you something about weights. For example, these beams right here were W16 by 26. 26 means 26 pounds per foot, or if we convert that to kips, it's 0 0.026 kips. So when the program is telling us that uh, the self weight of those members is 0 0.26. That is the W16 by 26 that we have in the designated section. You'll notice on the verticals, um, they say 0 0.808, which is 0 0.808 kips per foot or 808 pounds per foot. Now we want to go add another load case, which is excuse me, I got to go to cases, add case, static, and we're going to call this dead. Then we're going to add a case, static, which we're going to call live. And now we're going to add one more case, which is a static combined. And what I want to do is I want to add a factored load, which is 1.2 times self, 1.2 times dead, or dead imposed, 1.6 times live. And these numbers are how I tell the computer program how I want to weigh each of these load cases in doing this load combination. 
Now I need a name for that that I can understand. And I'm going to call it 1.2 self plus 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. So this is to make it intelligible to me. These numbers are to make it intelligible to the computer. So I do that load combination. And what's coming up on this image now is just the self load. And that's because we haven't put in any dead load yet. So we're now going to go back to dead. And there's nothing there because we haven't loaded it. So I remind you that we are going to load the roof joist or the roof secondary members with this uh, dead load and live load. And then we're going to load the floor joist or secondary members with this dead load and that live load. And I'm going to just remember those to make it go efficiently. But you can always look back at this table if you need to see that. So I'm going to go in and start that load process and I, you'll notice down here I'm under dead load and I'm going to pick the roof joist or secondary members and under dead load I'm going to put in global distributed load and I'll type in 0.14. You'll notice if I put it in the left end it shows up in the right end all automatically. I can go edit the right end if I want to. But since I'm talking about uniform loads here, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to click OK. And now I can either go down and load these joists if I want to. In fact, why don't I do this? I'm in the dead load case. And I already remember that um, the global distributed load for dead load was 0.35 kips per foot. And I do that load. And now I'm going to go to the live load case. And since I already have these highlighted, I'm going to go remind myself that the live load is 0.56. And I'm in the live load case. So I'm going to say global distributed load 0.56. And then finally, I'm going to go back to the dead load case. I hope I'm not confusing you. Whoops. Live load case. And I want to grab the roof members. So I will grab all these. Now I'm going to say the global distributed load is 0.14. It's the same as the dead load because the live load is 20 pounds a square foot and we've taken the dead load as 20 pounds per square foot. I'll remind you that this dead load of 20 pounds a square foot is uh, sort of an aggressively high number, which is generally recommended because your initial dead load could be pretty modest. It might only be 10 pounds a square foot, but you never know when people are going to come and hang on the structure something new that you didn't anticipate. Um, and so as a general rule, it's advised to go ahead and jack that number up to 20 pounds a square foot. So the dead load and the live load on the roof are both 20 pounds a square foot. And in this case, because we have a spacing between the secondary members of center at seven feet, that er brings us to a distributed live and dead load along the beams of 140 pounds per foot or 0.14 kips per foot. So now I have a fully loaded structure. I'm kind of compulsive about this, but I'm going to go uh, delete a case. There's a case in here called load case one. That's not a useful descriptor. I just want to get it out of there so that I don't ever inadvertently click on it and try to do something with it. So we have a frame. We have a fully loaded structure. Now we can go analyze. And then we're going to go to our plot window. And again, we're going to hit control total. We're going to maneuver this thing around. We're going to figure out what it's telling us. And right now, it's telling us the moment the, about the strong axis of these beams. And 
maybe for some people that's a useful number, but it's not for me and for most designers in steel. So um, we want to get out of that. And in this case, what we are in is we're in live load and we're sizing for stiffness under live load. So what we want to look at is the deflection of the structure. And when I hit that, I immediately know I've made a mistake. Uh, and the mistake I made was that I never released the ends of the beams. To help me make that more clear to you, I'm going to turn off these numbers. And you will notice how these beams have an upward slope or an angle at the ends here because they're connected to a, a beam that rotates easily. But through the center here, they're sort of curved over the top, which suggests that they have continuity across the middle there. As we've mentioned several times, um, especially when we talked about chapter three, and uh, typical connections for things. We mentioned that steel beams usually have a clip angle connection at the end, which involves just a few bolts that are bolted through the web of the beam. Uh, those bolts are not separated by any great distance, so they don't have a very good lever arm. Um, they often have slippage associated with them, and the holes are, are usually oversized in order to accommodate getting the bolts in. So, um, those uh, connections are not good moment connections and we typically assume that they're just not moment connections at all. So the mistake I made here was in my haste I did not select all the horizontal members and now I'm going to go to frame and I'm going to do member releases and I'm going to release MZ prime at both ends. That's the moment restraint um, against uh, deflection uh, or movement around the strong axis. So when I release those, it's like saying I have zero moment at the end of those beams to restrain those beams. And now if I go redo my analysis and I go jump back to my window here, now all of a sudden I'm seeing a completely different shape where these members come to the center. So now I have this diagram that shows all the deflections and I'm under live load, which is what I'm supposed to be under uh, for a set for deflection analysis. And by the way, it was all set up for unfactored live load. So this is not a matter of right or wrong. It's a matter that the whole system was set up uh, originally on under, under unfactored live load and all the criteria were set for that condition. So that's how we're analyzing this. So we see all these deflections. Now you'll notice there's a lot of deflection in the perimeter girders and in the uh, interior girders and the secondary members are actually deflecting down substantially at the ends. We want to look at the deflection of the secondary beams totally in terms of what does that beam deflect and not what does its supports deflect. So if we want to understand the deflection of one of these secondary beams, we click on that and you'll notice it says 1.125 inches. Now to get out of this, I can either, and that's the maximum vertical deflection in the Y direction. If I want to get out of this, I can either click there or hit escape. When I come down to the floor secondary beams, I get 1.376. So if we can, let's see if we can keep that number in mind. But what I'm going to do to make this as easy to see as possible is I'm going to blow it up. And then I'm going to do what you are instructed to do in your assignment. I'm going to come and do a snip. So I take my snip and sketch tool, which is supplied in this case with Windows 10. And I'm going to say I want a new one. And then I'm going to uh, surround 
a portion of this and I'm going down far enough to make sure that I'm showing in the lower left hand corner the case which is live and what I'm looking at which is deflection and now I'm going to say save that and I'm going to go over to wherever I was working on beams And I'm just, for the moment, I'm going to call this deflection. And now I'll close that. Now, um, I instructed you to create something like a suitcase <coughs> in a word file um, in my case I'm gonna use a PowerPoint file just because I use PowerPoint all the time and I'm comfortable in it and you're welcome to do that also I suggested a word file as your suitcase for your solution um, because more some of you may not have PowerPoint. Um, but the idea is I've now opened up this window in PowerPoint and I'm going to go insert within it the picture that I just saved. And it'll take me a second to go through my file structure to find where I'm supposed to be. And now I've got this diagram and I'm pasting it in. And then out of courtesy to whoever has to read this file, I'm blowing it up a little bit so that it's uh, visible. So in the instructions for this assignment, I asked you to indicate the deflection in all these members. And on this diagram, what I'm going to do is, you can't see this, but I'm going up above where it says insert, and I'm picking a text box, and then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to type that number 1.376 inches, which was the deflection of that member right there. Now, you're going to do this for every single member. And um, one thing that might make it easy for you is to just say you're going to duplicate. Excuse me. I'm going to duplicate and I'm going to move one up there. And then I'm going to hit duplicate and I'll put it on all these other members. And then I'll go right over what those numbers were in each of those uh, text blocks. Uh, so this number is no longer correct, so I'm going to just eliminate it and make sure that no one thinks that you're just duplicating it. So now I'm going to go back to multi-frame and give you one more example. I'm going to double click on this member and it says 1.125. So when I go back to here, I'm going to write 1.125 inches. And in the end, we're going to go through this whole thing and you're going to demonstrate that all of those deflections are less than 1.4 inches, but close to 1.4 inches. In other words, you're going to demonstrate that in fact, multi-frame seems to be suggesting it's getting the same numbers for these cross sections as you got from using tables because all these deflections look like they're sort of about the same and they're all over one inch and they're all less than 1.4. So we're pretty comfortable that we're verifying that multi-frame is in fact behaving uh, or predicting the same outcome that tables were. So now I've been living a little dangerously here because I don't think I've actually saved this file. And by the way, I could hit Control S now 
And I guess I did save it at some point, but I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say save as. And I'm going to then type in here the filing convention. So I'm putting my last name first, first name last. Then it says sizing steel beams and multi-frame and so forth. Sized for stiffness. So I'm going to go save that in this folder. I'm going to click OK. And now I want to save it again. So I'm going to go save as. And I'm going to say sized for strength. And I type that in. And now I got to go change everything in here. So I'm going to go back to um, the PowerPoint and find the table that I'm working off of, which is this one right here. So before I put in all of these sections here, now I'm going to put in all the sections in pink. And because I'm lazy, I'm going to look to see if there are some that I don't have to replace. So turns out I got the same section for strength and stiffness for that interior girder. I got the same strength and stiffness for that one. So I'll just focus on replacing the others. So I'll start with this. The uh, roof secondary beams were 16 by 26. W is 16 by 26 for stiffness. W10 by 12 for strength. So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go to the frame window. I'm going to select all these members. And then I'm going to go give them, instead of a W16 by 26, I'm going to give them a W10 by 12. And now I'm going to go to these which is the perimeter primary members. And instead of 21 by 44, they're supposed to be 18 by 40 when sized for strength. So I'll go find W18 by 40. Now you may recall I said that one doesn't change. That was a W24 by 62 for both stiffness and strength. But these change, and I'm going to go find the appropriate ones. They were 21 by 50 before for stiffness. Now they're 21 by 44. So I'm going to go in here and pick 21 by 44. And then we're going to uh, say these did not change because they were W30 by 90, and I'll just go verify it. It's 30 by 90 for stiffness, 30 by 90 for strength. But the interior one is going to change to a W16 by 136. So I'm not going to bother with those, but I am going to go change this one to a W36 by 135. So I now have the complete structure as it was sized in tables. And we're going to discover whether multi-frame gives the same result or not. So I'm going to analyze again. And then I'm going to go to the plot window. And now I'm not interested in deflection anymore and I'm not interested in the live load case. I'm interested in the full factor gravity load. Whoa, look at that deflection. But we don't care about that because we don't, we're not sizing for that. We're sizing for deflection under life load. So what are we looking for here? We're looking for bending stress SBZ prime. So now when I pull that up, I see something interesting. All these beams are made out of the same grade of steel. We expect them to all have about the same bending stress in them if we design them properly. We're trying to bring the bending stress close to 50, but always less than 50 kips per square inch. And now we got something really puzzling here because this one seems about like that one, which seems about like that one, 
which seems about like that one, which seems about like that one. But these are really weird. So now I got to go figure that out. I'm going to pause my video while I go look for that. And then I'll get back to you and let you know what's going on because this is a very disturbing result. Okay, so this is the table that we had before. I have traced it all through and absolutely everything in this analysis was done right. This value was set right. This was calculated right. We picked the right beam. And I made a mistake here because I should have written a W10 by 22. And I hit a W10 by 12. So I hit the wrong key. But I never caught that because it was like the last step and there was no verification that I didn't make a mistake on that. And my graduate students didn't catch it and none of the students in the class apparently caught it. Um, the tragic thing about this is that if we actually built this building at some point, there would probably be a load on the roof that would collapse the roof. Which brings to mind, by the way, before I go a step further, I'm going to tell you what that section should have been. It should have been a W10 by 22. So it brings to mind a practice that we have in the design of buildings and in structural analysis, which is no one should design a structure without someone checking it. And we always do that even for pretty small structures for really large and significant structures like a super tall building. Most of the firms who design buildings like that will have a clause in their contract that says they will execute that work using maybe four different pieces of structural analysis software being operated by four different individuals or groups and that the Design will not be finalized nor the building built until all any any and all discrepancies between the results of those analysis are hashed through and the analyses are demonstrated to be producing a consistent result. So we have the good fortune here that we did this by tables and this mistake got made and now we're doing it by multi-frame and we're catching that mistake. So now we're going to go back to multi-frame and we're going to go here and we're going to change this member from the totally wrong W10 by 12 and we're going to go to uh, we're going to go back to our sections library and grab a W10 by 22. Now we're going to analyze again analyze linear we go to our plot window and now everything looks sensible all of these members are producing the same result now there's a little funny thing that we have here you recall when we started this whole thing we said multi-frame by virtue of the way we've set it up tends to be a little more conservative now, we can go to great pains to use multi-frame in a way where it's not more conservative, but generally speaking, this is a very simple technique that I've shown you because when we look at this diagram, we should be getting very consistent results, and we are. All these curves look about the same, which says we haven't tremendously oversized or undersized anything. Um, but we did say that multi-frame tends to be a little more conservative. So I'm going to turn on the numbers here and we're going to discover that over here we got 50.40, which exceeds slightly. Here we get 50.46. Here we will even have 51.8. So in multi-frame it is predicting that the stress levels are higher. Um, this is a manifestation of that uh, way in which we're doing this analysis where multi-frame seems to be predicting higher stresses. 
if we were doing an actual building and multi-frame was the only tool we had, we would have to size all those members up. But we know already we did it by tables. We know the tables are right. We know that multi-frame tends to point us towards slightly conservative answers. And so we're not going to pursue this any further. We're going to take this diagram and finish fulfilling the requirements. So I'm going to get my snipping tool. I'm going to pick something new. I'm going to snip this and make sure I get the lower left hand corner where it tells me the, the case, the load case, and what we're looking at, which in this case is the bending stress in KSI. And then I'm going to save that and I'm going to just call it uh, bending stress And I have that image. And I'm going to close that. And I'm going to go back to my um, my PowerPoint. I'm going to insert that picture. which I'm then going to stretch out so it's readable. And this is, by the way, just common courtesy. You're doing this so whoever's looking at this file can actually read it. And now we have both of those. And I can go back to my multi-frame and I can hit save. And now I'm going to come up. And by the way, I didn't mention this, but when you first open a multi-frame file and you hit Control S on your keyboard, it may not let you save it that way. It may force you go up the first time to go up and say save. But once you've done it, you can do Control S on the keyboard. I don't know why it has that strange behavior. So I'm now going to save this as strength plus stiffness. And we're going to do the final multi-frame file where we choose the sections that work best for everything. Now, these ended up W10 by 22 for strength, but you may recall that for stiffness, they had to be a W16 by 26. So we go look at the yellow cells here where we've picked the larger of these two. So this one or that one, it ends up W21 by 24 and so forth. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to take this size right there and I'm going to put it back in for these. And fortunately that W... Well, it's not there anymore. So, oh, right here, 16 by 26. This one may need to be resized right now. It's 18 by 40. We come back here and it's not 18 by 40, but it's 21 by 44 from stiffness. So I'm going to go 21 by 44. And then I don't think this one needs to be changed because it was the same from both sizing procedures. But this one has to be changed because we have it at 21 by 44. Should be 21 by 50, which we see in the summarizing note. So we're going to come down here and select these and make them 21 by 50, which is right there. And then I think these two were the same. They were both 30 by 90. And then this one uh, we already have at 36 by 135. So that's our completed structure. And we've been asked to render that, which we do. And we'll rotate it around in some way so that we can begin to see the separation of the beams. So that looks pretty good right there. 
And now I'm going to go do the final step, which is I'm going to do a snippet, grab hold of all this, make sure I get uh, this legend with the section sizes in it. I'm going to save that, um, call it final frame, save it, close it, go back to my PowerPoint, find the blank page, then I'm going to insert that picture of the frame, and I'm going to stretch it out so it's as visible as possible. And now I have a PowerPoint, in my case, in your case, it may be a Word document, but the PowerPoint contains the three images that have been asked for. Deflection, bending stress under full factor load, deflection under lag load, bending stress under full factor load, and the rendered frame that accounts for both stiffness and strength. I have Got that file, and I'm going to save it off as a, an Adobe PDF, and that will be what I would submit to fulfill this assignment. I also have, as an end product of all this, three multi-frame files, which are not really that crucial to grading this project. They're there for the graduate students to check to make sure that um, your work has been done right. If they see some discrepancy in your, in your uh, PDF file that shows deflection under live load, bending stress under full factor gravity load, and the rendered frame. So that concludes this particular uh, example for you to work your way through along with the various steps to make sure that you understand how it's done.